Now, I should also mention that because of the level of degradation of the Ogoni environment, of the Niger Delta environment, of the oil fields of Nigeria, life expectancy has been diminished to 40 years. <coughs> so, when I go there, I appear like an ancestor. <laughs> and you know, before in Nigeria, somebody lives to 80 years or 90 years, when the person dies, a big party, say for a life well spent. You see the big banners for a life well spent, we celebrate the passing away of so so and so on. Now, a 25 year old boy dies, and you see put the banners for a life well spent. Which life? And that has happened because of the persistent pollution, unrepentant, unrelenting pollution by an industry that knows nothing but profit. Now, Nigeria has been here for fracking by share. And they already making efforts to frack in the Karu, in the Cape region of South Africa. They've mapped a number of countries where they want to frack. And we just need to look at what's going on in the United States to see how dangerous fracking is. I mean, I would not even mention the fact that so many fracking drilling holes also destabilize the, the, the geology so much so that, that tremors, earth tremors associated with fracking. But just think about the amount of chemicals used, which the sector would not reveal because it's a trade secret, just like the formula for Coca-Cola. And so they, they will bring a toxic mix cocktail, a toxic cocktail of over 500 chemicals, and pump them through the aquifer, up to two kilometers down, three kilometers down, with huge amount, millions of liters of water, to fracture, to rupture, destructure the rock, and get some gas out. And that's what they I'm sure you know about it. Just, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, I, I'm not here to talk about the details of the of fracking because it is harmful both to the water bodies and the waste water itself cannot return to the water cycle because it's so dangerously polluted. And so in a time where we have big water, where water is becoming a scarce resource and water conflicts are already happening in the world, how can a sector be allowed to take away, take such huge amounts of water out of water cycle? The way we use water in agriculture, in domestic use, is such that the water goes back and comes out, keep using it. But now you take water for fracking, it never goes back, except you want to poison people. I've heard some people say they can do fracking without using chemicals. Sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds good to my ear too. But it's, it's a dangerous proposal, which we need to look at very carefully. One thing I heard, I've heard from some pollution though, that there's a technology that can actually frack rock relying on heat. Not a hundred degrees centigrade, but thousands of degrees. Where huge territories with rock can be subjected to heat for months. It's not been tried anywhere in the world yet. But scientists believe they can do this. And then you heat up that, and then you melt it, and then you get the gas to be liberated. Now, I'm not saying that this is what is proposed for Ireland because nobody has said exactly what they mean when they say they can track without using a toxic cocktail of chemicals. But what no proposal anybody brings must be in your What chemicals are you using? Can it be contained? When the problems happen, are we ready to accept the impacts? Are we ready to be poisoned? Uh, would the compensation, would the economic compensation be enough? Would creating a few hundred jobs be equal to the loss of lives, for example? You know, where I come from, corporations talk about corporate social responsibility. And sometimes I don't like to offend people when I say that. As far as I see in the oil sector, corporate social responsibility is an oxymoron. It's like talk about plastic ice cream. 
It does not happen. Because in communities where furnace of gas is aimed at people at ground level, they will build a clinic just close to the gas furnace. And so I lie down in bed and I have a drink in one hand, giving me good feeling medicine. And then on this hand, I'm being poisoned. And so poison comes, health comes. And then I stay there, paralyzed. And somebody says, well, I've given them hospitals. I've given them schools. I've given them this or that. Absolute nonsense. The oil sector in Nigeria provides. And this, this is, when I, when I talk about Nigeria, it's because I come from Nigeria and I live there, and I know what I'm talking about, but I've also seen, I've seen this across the tropical belt. And I can see it in Canada, where a territory as big as Belgium has been subjected to tax and extractions. So it's both in the global north and the global south that this thing is happening. I've seen situations where millions of people are thrown out of livelihoods. Fishermen cannot fish, thousands of them cannot fish, farmers cannot farm, and then you give 2,000 jobs. What is that? 2,000 people are employed, and millions are thrown out of jobs. What kind of statistics are we talking about? And so what, what I believe and what my passion and for what I'm seeing around here, I feel, I feel the energy of resilient activists who believe that community interest must come before corporate interest. And if we're going to allow anything, it must be as accepted by the, by the people, not as dictated by industry, no matter how very bullet the industry may be. But I must say that it's not an easy fight. It's not an easy fight, of course, in Nigeria. It's not an easy fight anywhere at all, because what is driving this very dangerous activity is the global crisis of environmental change global warming, economic crisis, financial crisis, food crisis, and another food crisis is on the horizon because of droughts and unusual weather events. Land grabs forcing people to, to migrate from their communities because land is being grabbed to cultivate crops that instead of feeding people, is now used to feed machines, especially in Europe. There are people who call themselves Sovereignty entrepreneurs. And so they go to African countries and they say, well, this country is likely going to split into two, and then they buy up land in the area they believe they can have influence. And so when you hear about conflicts on the continent, it's not because people just want to, to be in conflict, because some people have vested corporations, have vested interests to grab land and also to create the conflict so that they can enhance their influence and grab resources. One case in point, a company from the U.S. bought up 600,000 hectares of land in South Sudan before independence of South Sudan, before the country became a country, before the country became a country. And they had an agreement with a local chief who did not even read, who couldn't even read or understand the agreement. This is the, the method of exploitation to utilize the land for 50 years and they had the right to all mineral, mineral resources on the land. Gas, oil, gold, whatever is found there. All, the right to all the timber, right to grow crops. They do use the land anyhow they want to use it for 50 years. And they paid a princely sum of $25,000. What a scandal. I could give you an example upon example. And so the global crisis being fed by speculation, financial speculation, food speculation, is happening again. And rival food rivals will erupt in the next few months across many places in the world. 
because of the activities of speculation, speculators. Because all this has been happening basically because the world is locked into the fossil part that we must continue with fossil fuels. When easy oil is not possible, then we go into fracking. We go into deep water drilling. We go to natural nature reserves. Nothing is sacred as long as we are get fossil fuels. But you know what? I believe what the former minister, foreign minister of Saudi Arabia said, and he said, the stone age did not end for lack of stones. <laughs> and the crude oil age will not end for lack of crude oil. It will make sense for humanity to realize that this civilization, oil has been driving civilization for 150 years now. It's not as if you've been doing this for one thousand, only 150 years and read everything. So it's time to advise. Humanity has to advise itself that this civilization mode cannot go on forever. Oil is not a renewable resource, it's going to be exhausted, and the sooner the alternatives, the renewable alternatives for any, any generation, uh, focus on investing in the better for humanity. And the sooner we push for this very strongly on a global level, joining the actions in Ireland to the actions of the imparted peoples in Nigeria, in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, in North America, in other parts of Europe, standing up to reclaim our sovereignty from structures that don't respond to the needs of the people, be better for our children and gradually better for Mother Earth. We can send a robot to Mars, but you're not going to replicate Mother Earth. And we have a duty to reconnect, or you know that human persons, human beings, are just one part of the ecosystem. And the sooner we begin to respect the planet, the better for us. You can just keep drilling and drilling and drilling. One Chinese proverb says, when you are in a hole, the first thing to do to get out of the hole is to stop digging. But the way we're going, we want to keep on digging and digging and digging. And we're not digging to anywhere that is going to save the planet. And so I thank you so much for coming out this evening. Uh, it's a, a privilege for me to stand before you and I thank you for paying attention to me. And if anything at all that you heard me say this evening is one thing that I love your country, I love the environment I've seen, and I believe that what you, what you have should be defended and protected. And I thank you so much for your attention.